Thanks. I'm joined now by United States Senator Mike Lee, who faces a historic vote at 3 p.m. in the Senate today. But good morning, Senator Lee. Welcome back to The Hugh Hewitt Show. Thank you, Hugh. Good to be with you. I always have to disclose, I've only held one fundraiser for a senator ever in, in my life before I joined NBC, and I could do so. It was for Mike Lee, having disclosed that, Senator. Tell me what you thought first of the speech, then of the speaker tearing up the speech. The speech was fantastic. It was one of the very best speeches I've ever heard any president give, including this one. I mean, this was just a, a phenomenal speech. It spoke to everyone. I understand that there are things in there that a liberal wouldn't like, but there were a lot of things in there that should have made people just proud to be uh, part of this country, uh, part to be proud to be an American citizen. And so the sitting speaker of the House ripped it up at the end of it. It's just really lowbrow. Hey, you know, it's disappointing. Um, look, it's no secret that Nancy Pelosi and I don't share a lot in common politically or that she and the president don't share a lot in common politically. But there's no cause for that. That's, that's an indication that she doesn't respect the office that he holds or that she herself holds, frankly. And uh, I, I think the American people really deserve more than that. I had a caller this morning, Senator Lee, who said it's the people's house. It's not Nancy Pelosi's house. It's not Donald Trump's house. It's the people's house. And decorum is expected. It is. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that many of her voters, many of her own supporters, her own donor base and her own members would be disappointed by what she did, even if they agree with her on every single political point. They should not want a speaker who will act in such a petulant manner as to disrespect what just happened there. Now, I know in Utah, you've got a lot of military spouses because you've got a lot of bases and you've got a lot of people who are deployed and you've got a lot of people who haven't come home. And I just am astonished that in a speech that honored a Tuskegee Airman, uh, a fallen soldier killed by Soleimani, his widow and child, a reunited military family after four tours. I'm, I'm just astonished that your colleagues across the aisle cannot lay down their blue bubble politics for an hour and a half. Juan Guaido in the audience who is fighting for the lives of all those people in Venezuela. What has happened to the Democrats? Well, I, I think um, I, I hope. But she doesn't speak for all of them. And I hope that you'll see Democrats coming out today saying they don't support what she did or how she acted. If they don't, I do think they'll pay a big price for it in November. And I think they really should, because I don't think most of the American people have that vision, even of the Democratic Party. The fact that they can't endure a few lines with which they disagree uh, speaks volumes about them and about who they are, about how out of touch they are with the American people. I mean, look, yeah, you know, I, I sat for many years as Barack Obama was president of the United States, and he always included within that speech uh, a bunch of lines that I really strongly disagreed with. And I, I would state that in interviews afterwards, but I did it in a way that I hope was respectful and certainly didn't stand there in the House chamber and rip up a document as if to uh, tear those words apart in effigy. It's wrong. Now, Senator, I'm on in Salt Lake right now. I'm on in Utah right now. We're talking to people via talk radio. It's a mall, I like to say, that was built by Rush Limbaugh. I'm just the Nordstrom store in it. All of the other hosts in America are just living in the mall that Rush Limbaugh built. I don't expect people who disagree with his politics to do applause for him, but I do expect them to encourage a cancer survivor and encourage him in his his quest. I also think Republicans are just applauding that he broke the blue bubble and broke the monopoly on free speech. What did you think of that moment last night? You know, I thought it was terrific. I've been an admirer of Rush Limbaugh for about 30 years, and uh, it, it was great to see him there last night. It was great to see him honored. As much as anything, Hugh, it, it was uh, a privilege to be able to see his face when the president made that announcement. He was as shocked as anyone when he learned that he was the recipient of the award. He thought he had received his shout out and uh, uh, couldn't believe it uh, when he received the award at that moment. It was it was pretty remarkable to watch at home, and I do believe talk radio provides a service that does not 
get a lot of attention inside of the blue bubble. I, I talked to people today from east to west. They call in with their reactions. The blue bubble just has put people inside of this this echo chamber. And I wonder, Senator Lee, before we turn to impeachment, if that isn't the reason why impeachment happened because of the blue bubble. Oh, there's no question exactly why it happened. And the blue bubble has become so intense and so exclusive of all, all of her uh, uh, other thoughts that might enter their mind that they couldn't get out of it. And it built up this pressure that Nancy Pelosi herself knew was wrong. She knew that it was wrong to go after a president with impeachment articles without broad-based bipartisan support. And she did it anyway because the force became overwhelming. How will you vote today on the two articles of impeachment? Uh, I, I, I'm going to vote no, and uh, I, I would vote heck no. Um, in other words, I'll be I'll be voting to protect the president's innocence. Uh, look, he didn't do anything wrong here. This was a, a phone call that involved an encouragement of Ukraine to investigate a corrupt Ukrainian energy company, Burisma, that the Obama administration itself had asked the Ukrainian government to investigate for years. Not only is that not impeachable, it's not wrong. That's what I say. There Not only was there no impeachable offense, there's no offense in the phone call. Now, do you expect no. every Republican to vote to acquit? I do. I do. I'll, I'll actually be shocked if we lose a single Republican on do, that question. Do you expect any Democrats to join in the vote to acquit? I won't be surprised if we pick up a couple. Um, you know, there's widespread speculation about uh, Joe Manchin, about Kirsten Cinema, and about Doug Jones. Uh, I suspect that two out of those three could join us. I don't think Doug Jones will. The other two might. Now, talk to me a little bit. You're a very fine constitutional lawyer about the presentation, just as a as a working uh, litigator and someone who's made a lot of arguments. Who impressed you in the well of the Senate this past week? You know, the president's legal team, uh, led by Pat Cipollone, did a fantastic job. Uh, some of my favorite individual arguments uh, came from him and from Pat Philbin. Some of them uh, came from Ken Starr, and I really enjoyed uh, the Alan Dershowitz arguments. You know, I frequently disagree with Alan on a lot of issues. But I thought Alan's presentations were good. I'm not sure that he's right that there has to be a crime alleged in an obstruction of justice charge, but he sure made me think about it. And I don't think we have to reach the question in this case, uh, but his presentations were fantastic. Uh, let me ask you the, the real $64,000 question. If you were being pursued by a crazed political charge and a prosecutor out of control, which one of the lawyers would you hire? Which one of the president's lawyers? Yes. Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I, I think I'd be comfortable with any of the names I mentioned just representing me. Uh, which one I hired might depend on the venue and the forum for resolving it. But I can see myself being very comfortable represented by Pat Cipollone or by Pat Philbin. Uh, or I'd hire Hunter Pat Philbin. Or Ken Starr. I would hire yeah. Pat Philbin. I just watched him and I said, this is how you win an argument. I mean, they were all very good. They all made their points. I, <laughs> Dersh is Dersh. I don't agree with the with a couple of his arguments or at least how they've been presented. He said he's been unfairly caricatured. And by that point, I turned it off by the time Dersh would spoke. But Pat Philbin was just what a litigator. You've heard, I mean, you clerk for Sam Alito. You've heard some of the best litigators in America. That was a tour de force on how to make an argument. He is a lawyer's lawyer. And he did it with enough emotion and passion that you felt it. But he also proceeded with the sort of uh, objectivity that you hope and expect from an officer of the court. And uh, I found it very persuasive. Now, I want to close by an unusual question. The coronavirus is um, out of control in mainland China with asymptomatic transmission, but its morbidity 
is not as nearly as it's is much higher than its mortality. It's killing two percent, maybe. Do you trust the statistics we're getting from the People's Republic of China on this? Well, no, because communist regimes in general, and China in particular, uh, don't exactly have the best track record of, um, you know, telling the truth uh, for the sake of the truth. I, I also doubt their ability, their, just their physical capacity to administer testing protocols uh, faithfully and completely enough with something that's spreading this quickly to be able to get us accurate data. So it may be that they don't want to tell us the truth. It may be that they physically lack the capacity to track it uh, with enough faithfulness. I, I've got to assume that whatever the true numbers are, uh, may will be several multiples of what they're giving us. Senator Mike Lee, thank you for joining us to review the State of the Union and on this historic day when you will be voting to acquit Donald Trump. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Senator. Thank you, Hugh.